The reading for today is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And then last of all then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Good morning. Happy Easter, everybody. Um, for those of you that are visitors, uh, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor here, and a huge welcome to you and to everybody else this morning. It is indeed a wonderful day to be in church this morning and to worship the Lord. Um, Jade, uh, sitting at the back there, I, I have to say, Jade, I was sitting there so proud to hear you sing. It was just absolutely beautiful. What a beautiful song. And I know Jenny Ann has struggled with her voice in the last couple of days, but God undertook and she was able to sing beautifully this morning. So what a, what a wonderful um, start to this service. And uh, looking at the videos, I don't think I will ever see another Easter Saturday without thinking it to be Saturday. <laughs> um, that was a first for me, and, uh, and I've, had celebrate, I've celebrated many an Easter in the last uh, 45 years or whatever it is since I got saved, and uh, I have never heard that, and I love it. So, um, yeah, and I, look, I went into my PowerPoint this morning, and... It doesn't look anything like the PowerPoint that I sent through, and I'm sure that has something to do with Ellen, does it? No? Uh, it was Nathan. Well, well done to Nathan. Um, that's, uh, he's done a great job putting the extra touches to my PowerPoint with the Easter eggs and etc. Well, I want to start by saying if you wanted to convert me, to become an atheist, the one thing, the only thing that you would need to do is to prove to me that the resurrection did not happen. Because Jesus hung his entire divinity on that one event. And if there was no resurrection, then there's no Christianity. Jesus would have just died a tragic death and it would have just been recognized as, the, as a tragic death of the best man that ever lived. But because of the resurrection, we know what the cross was all about. Because of Easter, we understand the meaning of Good Friday. What a, a topsy-turvy week it has been. Last Sunday, it started off with Jesus riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey, certainly not as quickly as the picture <laughs> showed him riding in, but Jesus riding in and the, the streets were lined with people waving the palm branches, Hosanna to the son of David. Just glorifying him, them thinking that he is going to be a king that's going to stand up to, to Caesar and be able to take power back because the, the Jewish people were being oppressed by the Romans and they were looking forward to this day. 
But it didn't turn out that way, did it? And it was, a, it, it was an up and down week where we saw Jesus overturn tables in the, in, in the temple where people were bartering and, and, and he got all the people offside because that, that was the place where they were making money and, and Jesus said, you're making the house of God a den of thieves. Uh, and then they thought, well, He's not standing up to Caesar. He's standing up against us. And so one of the blokes went and said, you know, and is, do you think it's fair that we have to give our taxes to Caesar? And, uh, the, of course, they're expecting the answer. No, of course not. You just wait and see. He'll have his lot. I'll, I'll fix that. But no, he asked for a coin and said, whose face is on that? Caesar's. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. He upset them with the things that he did. And then by the end of the week, it literally five days after, uh, after they were singing Hosanna to the son of David, literally five days later, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. So they put him on a cruel cross. What a week. What a week. People denied that there was a resurrection. For many years. Quite a thing. But praise God that there were so many things that took place to show that the resurrection did exist, even in history books. And I'm going to look at some of the things this morning for us to see. Because at the cross, Jesus died in our place for our sins. He entered into our pain and shame, and he broke the weight of evil itself. And so that is the power, and that power could be broken. But these people were trying to deny the resurrection. And, and so, um, for instance, when Jesus died, God miraculously did two things, didn't he? He made the earth go dark for three hours. and and straight after that was an earthquake. Now, the experts went back in time to look at all the earthquakes in the area. And they discovered that from the beginning, or, um, uh, fr from the birth of Christ until today, there was three earthquakes in that area. <clears throat> they discovered one of the earthquakes was in AD 33. That's non-Christian people doing their research. There was an earthquake. And then they tried to explain away the darkness for three hours. They said it must have been an eclipse. Well, there's three reasons why it couldn't have been an eclipse. <clears throat> the one reason is that it was at Passover time and it was a full moon. And so it needs to be when, when it's furthest away, when the moon is small, that an eclipse takes place. Secondly, this took place at midday, in the middle of the day. So there couldn't have been an eclipse. And thirdly, the longest recorded eclipse in history lasted seven minutes and 20 seconds. And this was three hours. There were many other things that took place to prove that Jesus was alive again. Jesus appeared to many people. And at one time, he appeared to 500 people at the same time. And on two separate occasions, he allowed people to touch him and feel the wounds. So it's been recorded in history. And I want to tell you that if the resurrection was a hoax, the people that walked with him for three years, his disciples, why would they allow themselves to, to be martyred in the way that they were? There's only one disciple that died of natural causes, and that was John, who died on the island of Patmos. All the others were martyred. 
Some of them on a cross that was inverted. Some of them pulled apart by chariots going that way and that way. The, the disciples were martyred. Why would they allow themselves to do that if it was a hoax? Because they knew that they had seen Jesus again and it changed their life forever. And then the skeptics didn't know how to argue with that. So they tried to think up another argument and they said, you know what, all right, because there were so many people that saw him alive, we'll, we'll believe it. But we don't think he died. I think we, we just think that he was resuscitated. He never died. I want to give you a snapshot this morning of what Jesus went through. And you decide whether you think that what he went through, he died. Jesus' death really started in the Garden of Gethsemane because when he went to go and pray, he prayed in such agony that there were sweat drops of blood. Now, I'm a bit nervous to speak about these medical things because we've got, uh, we've got uh, Professor Dean with us today and uh, he, uh, he might correct me on uh, some pronunciations and things, but hopefully I've got the facts right. But when we look at Luke chapter 22, verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is actually a medical condition called hematohydrosis. And it occurs in, ble it occurs in bleeding disorders, and it may occur in individuals suffering from extreme levels of stress. Around the sweat glands, there's multiple blood vessels in a net-like form which constrict under the pressure of great stress. And it's rare, it's a very rare condition. In the 20th century, there's only, there's only three recorded cases of this happening. Um, and uh, it's said to be as a result of severe distress. And it was said that this was really the start of Jesus dying. The, the severe distress that he had on him from carrying the weight of the sin of the world upon his shoulder. And it became so much for him that when he prayed, he actually said to, to God, he said, my father, please take this cup away from me. In other words, I don't want to, I know what I'm going into and I don't want to do it. Please take this cup away from me. Because he knew that there was a time coming when the father would have to turn his back on Jesus because the father cannot look upon sin. And he said, take this cup away from me. Yet, not my will, but yours. And because it was will of the Father, he knew he was going to go through it and suffer extreme um, distress and pain. What did he go through? Well, he was flogged 39 times. Why 39? It seems an odd number, doesn't it? Do you know why 39 times? because it was said that 40 was enough to kill you. So they stop at 39. The whip was made, made from braided leather with metal balls and sharp pieces of bone and shards of metal woven into them. The metal balls would cause deep contusions and bruises, which would later burst open. The shards of bone would dig into the flesh and ripped out, causing bits of flesh to be torn from the body. The back would become so shredded and cut so deep that parts of the spine would show of the victim. And very often, the whip would latch itself around the torso and tear off skin around there too. The person's veins would be exposed. And many people died from this even before they were crucified. And the person would also lose so much blood that they would go into hypovolemic shock. 
This does four things. The first thing it does is the heart races to pump blood that is not there. So secondly, the blood pressure drops, causing collapse. Thirdly, the kidneys stop producing urine to maintain what's left. And then fourthly, the body craves liquid to replace the lost blood, causing extreme thirst. And this is why Jesus, hanging on the cross, said, I thirst. That's what was happening to his body. All this took place even before Jesus was put on the cross. He was already in a serious medical condition. Now listen to this. I've just told you what happened to Jesus when he was scourged. Now magnify that by two, because he was scourged with 39 lashes, not once, but twice. And then he had to carry that cross or drag it. You can imagine his back was torn open and the weight of that cross, of that wood, he had to carry it. And historians say the distance that he carried that cross was 600 meters. That's probably roughly the distance of from here to the traffic lights by the fish and chip shop. No wonder somebody else had to take over and carry the cross. Can you imagine what that did to his body? And then the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns on his head. Let me tell you, those thorns were not the thorns that you see on roses. I've been to Israel to see there's a common thorn there that uh, the, the history books say those thorns are about three centimeters. I looked at those thorns. I reckon they're about three inches. They're big thorns. And they were, they were pushed down into his head where those thorns pierced into his scalp. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine? Next was the worst thing of all. That was the cross. The, in, the, the, the nails that went into him were about seven inches long. And they didn't go through the hands because his weight of his body hanging on nails that went through the hand would just tear his hand. They went through the wrists and it would pierce the nerves in the wrist. Excruciating pain. As I mentioned on Friday, it would be the same thing when you knock your funny bone, that nerve there. It's as if when you take a pliers and you squeeze that nerve really tight, that's kind of the pain that he would have suffered when that, those nails went into his hands. That's why they created a new English word, excruciating which means out of the cross. And today the word is reserved for describing the most physical pain and agony, excruciating. And after they hoisted the cross up and the nails were driven through his feet, his nerves there would have been crushed as well. And experts say that as the cross was lifted up and jolted into place, Experts say that Jesus' arms would have stretched by about six inches, dislocating both shoulders. Then the pressure of the weight on those nails would have caused him to suffocate a slow, agonizing death. And yet it was not the physical pain that killed him. It was our sins on him that killed him. His mental anguish was so severe and having the sins of the world, past, present, and future on him. And for a moment, he was separated from God. And it was this pressure of our sin that caused his heart to fail. So in a sense, he died of a broken heart. Died of a broken heart. But before he died, the rapid heart rate brought on by the loss of blood would have led to a collection of fluid in the membrane around the heart. And that's called pericardial effusion. And then the Roman soldier took a spear and pushed it into Jesus' side, looking for the heart. 
John chapter 19, 34 says that a soldier pierced his side and out came blood and water. The fluid built up around the heart in that membrane would have been clear like water. And this was proof that he truly was dead. That is a medical term, that pericardial effusion, that fluid that went up there, that would have been clear. So when, when that spear went in, and those Roman soldiers were so well trained, they would have known exactly where to put that to get it into the heart and to be sure that he was dead. Then he was placed in a tomb with a huge stone rolled in front and the stone weighed about one to two tons. Again, people tried to explain it away and said the Roman soldiers must have been asleep. Now, let me tell you something about Roman soldiers. They know that if there was an error in any way that could be pointed back at them, it would mean death for them. That's why they worked on a four-hour shift. They changed guards every four hours. Maybe one person could fall asleep, but not all of them. And even if they were asleep, to move a stone that weighed a minimum of a ton would require a lot of people. And the movement of that stone, just even every inch that it moved, it would have made quite a noise. Those people would have been awake. and They would have been in trouble. It would have been impossible to move it. But just after sunrise, on a Sunday morning, why didn't those women go there on Saturday, on sadder day? Because it was Sabbath. You weren't allowed to go on Sabbath. So they waited till the earliest time that they were allowed to go. The moment it was no longer Sabbath, as the sun started to rise, it was no longer Sabbath and they ran. Because you see, they knew that Jesus' body would not have been properly embalmed. They wanted to go there to give him a proper embalmment, to go to the, the tomb. That's when they discovered the tomb was empty. They had an opportunity, these women. We have to understand something in the culture of the Jewish culture. Women were of a lower standard than a man. Women were not allowed to, to talk. If women witnessed something, people would not even recognize it because they were women. So for women to have the pleasure of getting there first and having an encounter with an angel, even recording that must have been hard for G Jewish people to record that, that it was women. What an incredible thing for those women. Such an incredible thing. It was literally the best news in history of the mankind because resurrection, the resurrection changed everything. The resurrection changed everything. And I've given you a very graphic description of what Jesus went through to show you, do you think that after going through all of that, that he could possibly have been alive through all of that? And even if he was in such a state, do you think he from the inside that he could have rolled that stone away? He could never have gone through all of that. So what does the resurrection mean for us today? Just recognizing that he died for our sins is not enough. We must accept his resurrection in order to have eternal life. Christ paid our debt, but his sacrifice on the cross means nothing if he possesses no power over the grave. Jesus' resurrection proved he was able to remove the sin and its penalty of sin. If Christ remained dead, it would mean accepting the opposite, that believers are still in sin.
and the inevitable end of sin, life is death. Either we believe Christ rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, or we do not. If we reject his victory over the grave, we deny ourselves a place in eternity. But if we accept the truth, Paul assures us that we will be saved. This is what he said in, in John chapter 2. Because Jesus himself proclaimed that his resurrection would prove his power. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Obviously, they thought that it was a physical temple. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. It was his body. Jesus, as early as John chapter 2, already said to people that this body, this temple is going to be destroyed and it will be raised up again in three days. Already in John chapter 2, he gave them a glimpse and he already told them that it was not a physical temple, but this temple. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he said, and then, then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, once that resurrection had taken place, suddenly they remembered his words. Ah, this temple will be destroyed. He'll raise it in three days. Wow, that's what happened. Suddenly they remembered that scripture, and it says, then they believed. See, we have the hindsight of already knowing that scripture. They didn't. We already saw. We had insight into seeing what scripture said. And then one other scripture I want to read for us is part of what Roland already read for us in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There Paul says it as well. He died, rose again and um, happened according to Scripture. The resurrection changed everything. Because of the re resurrection, we can be forgiven of our sins. Think of it. Think of it. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus died and rose again. And the power of sin that kept us bound has been broken. The resurrection changed everything. Scripture tells us that God shows us his love, shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, while we were stuck in our sin, while we were caught in a trap, Jesus came and died for us. Today is your day. Today is your day. This is love. This is love. Love took him to the cross. Love kept him on the cross and love gave him victory over death and sin for you and for me that we can meet here every week and rejoice in what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your, for your, um, your words. We thank you for your deeds. We thank you that you indeed even though you knew what you were going into um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it must have been traumatic knowing what you were heading into. And yet you did that for each one of us because you loved us and because God loves us. Your word says that 
God loved us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us that we may have eternal life. And we thank you. We're forever grateful this morning. And we want to lift our voices to the heavens and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.